Chapter 6 A man asked me if I had given up shooting. He had not heard me fire a shot up in the hills, though he had been out fishing for two days. No, I had shot nothing. I had stayed at home in the hut until I had no more food in the place. On the third day I went out with my gun. The woods were getting green. There was a smell of the earth and trees. The young grass was already springing up from the frozen moss. I was in a thoughtful mood and sat down several times. For three days, I had not seen a soul except the one fisherman I had met the day before. I thought to myself, perhaps I may see someone this evening on the way home at the edge of the wood, where I met the doctor and Eduardo before. Perhaps they may be going for a walk that way again. Perhaps. Perhaps not. But why should I think of those two in particular? I shot a couple of ptarmigan and cooked one of them at once. Then I tied up the dog. I lay down on the dry ground to eat. The earth was quiet, only a little breath of wind and the sound of a bird here and there. I lay and watched the branches waving gently in the breeze. The little wind was at its work, carrying pollen from branch to branch and filling every innocent bloom. All the forest seemed filled with delight. A green worm thing, a caterpillar, dragged itself end by end along a branch, dragging along unceasingly as if it could not rest. It saw hardly anything, for it had eyes Often it stood straight up in the air, feeling about for something to take hold of. It looked like a stump of green thread sewing a seam with long stitches along the branch. By evening, perhaps, it would have reached its goal. Quiet as ever, I get up and move on, sit down and get up again. It's about four o'clock. About six, I can start for home and see if I happen to meet anyone. Two hours to wait, a little restless already. I brush the dust and heather from my clothes. I know the places I pass by. Trees and stones sand, stand there as before in the solitude. The leaves rustle underfoot as I walk. The monotonous breathing and the familiar trees and stones mean much to me. I'm filled with strange thankfulness. Everything seems well disposed toward me mingles with my being. I love it all. I pick up a dry little twig and hold it in my hand and sit looking at it and think of my own thoughts. The twig is almost rotten. Its poor bark touches me. Pity fills my heart. And when I get up again, I do not throw the twig far away, but lay it down and stand liking it. At last, I look at it once more with wet eyes before I go away and Leave it there. Five o'clock, the sun tells me, false time today. I've been walking westward the whole day and come perhaps half an hour ahead of my sun marks at the hut. I'm quite aware of all this, but nonetheless, there is an hour yet before six o'clock, so I get up again and go on a little, and the leaves rustle underfoot. An hour goes that way. I look down at the little stream and the little mill that has been ice-bound all the winter, and I stop. The mill is working. The noise of it wakes me, and I stop suddenly. There and then, I have stayed too long, I say aloud. A pang goes through me. I turn at once and begin walking homeward, but all the time I know I have stayed out too long. I walk faster than run. Aesop understands there's something the matter and pulls at the leash, drags me along, sniffs at the ground, and all is haste. The dry leaves crackle about us, but when we come to the edge of the wood, there was no one there. No, all was quiet. There was no one there. There is no one here, I said to myself, and yet it was no worse than I had expected. I did not stay long, but walked on dragged by all my thoughts, passed by my hut, and went down to Cyrilland with Aesop and my bag and gun, with all my belongings.
Aramac received me with the greatest friendliness and asked me to stay for supper. Chapter 7 I fancy I can read a little of the souls of those about me, but perhaps it's not so. Oh, when my good days come, I feel as if I could see far into other souls, though I'm no great or clever head. We sit in the room, some men, some women, and I. I seem to see what's passing within them and what they think of me. I find something in every swift little change of light in their eyes. Sometimes the blood rises to their cheeks and reddens them. At other times, they pretend to be looking another way, and yet they watch me covertly from the side. There I sit, marking all this, and no one dreams that I see through every soul. For years past, I have felt that I could read the souls of all I met, but perhaps it's not so. I stayed at Air Max's house all that evening. I might have gone off again at once. I didn't. It did not interest me to stay sitting there, but had I not come because all my thoughts were drawing me that way? And how could I go again at once? We played whilst we drank toddy after supper. I sat with my back turned to the rest of the room and my head bent down. Behind me, Edwarda went in and out. The doctor had gone home. Ermac showed me the design of his new lamps, the first paraffin lamps to be seen so far north. They were splendid things with heavy leaden base and he lit them himself every evening to prevent any accident. He spoke once or twice of his grandfather, the consul. This brooch was given to my grandfather, Consul Mac, by Carl Johan with his own hands, he said, pointing one finger at a diamond in his shirt. His wife was dead. He showed me a painted portrait of her in one of the other rooms, a distinguished-looking woman with a lace cap and a winsome smile. In the same room, also, there was a bookcase and some old French books, no less that might have been an heirloom. The bindings were rich and gilded, and many owners had marked their names in them. Among the books were several educational works. Ermac was a man of some intelligence. His two assistants from the store were called in to make up the party at whist. They played slowly and doubtfully, counted carefully, and made mistakes all the same. Edwarda helped one of them with his hand. I upset my glass and felt ashamed and stood up. There, I have it upset my glass, I said. Edward burst out laughing and answered, Well, we can see that. Everyone assured me laughingly that it did not matter. They gave me a towel to wipe myself with, and we went on with the game. Soon, it was 11 o'clock. I felt a vague displeasure at Edward's laugh. I looked at her and found that her face had become insignificant, hardly even pretty. At last, Ermac broke off the game, saying that his assistants must go to bed. Then he leaned back on the sofa and began talking about putting up a sign in front of his place. He asked my advice about it. What color did I think would be best? I was not interested and answered black without thinking at all and Air Mac at once agreed. Black, yes, exactly what I've been thinking myself. Salt and barrels and heavy black letters. That ought to look as nice as anything. Edwarda, isn't it time you were going to bed? Edwarda rose, shook hands with us both, said good night and left the room. We sat on. We talked of the railway that had been finished last year and of the first telegraph line. Wonder when we shall have the telegraph up here. Pause. 
It's like this, said Ermac. Time goes on, and here I am, six and forty, and hair and beard gone gray. You might see me in the daytime and say I was a young man, but when the evening comes along and I'm all alone, I feel it a good deal. I sit here mostly playing in patience. Works out all right as a rule, if you fudge a little. <laughs> if you fudge a little, I asked. Yes. I felt as if I could read in his eyes. He got up from his seat, walked over to the window, and looked out. He stooped a little, and the back of his neck was hairy. I rose in my turn. He looked round and walked toward me in his long pointed shoes, stuck both thumbs in his waistcoat pockets, waved his arms a little as if they were wings, and smiled. Then he offered me his boat again if ever I wanted one and held out his hand. Wait a minute. I'll go with you, he said, and blew out the lamps. Yes. Yes, I feel like a little walk. It's not so late. He went out. He pointed up the road toward the blacksmiths and said, This way, it's the shortest. No, I said, round by the quay is the shortest way. We argued the point a little and did not agree. I was convinced that I was right and could not understand why he insisted. At last he suggested that we should each go his own way. The one who got there first could wait at the hut. We set off, and he was soon lost to sight in the wood. I walked at my usual pace and reckoned to be there a good five minutes ahead. But when I got to the hut, he was there already. He called out as I came up. What did I say? I always go this way. It is the shortest. I looked at him in surprise. He was not heated and did not appear to have been running. He did not stay now, but said good night in a friendly way and went back the way he had come. I stood there and thought to myself, this is strange. I ought to be some judge of distance, and I've walked both those ways several times. My good man, you've been fudging again. Was the whole thing a pretense? I saw his back as he disappeared into the wood again. Next moment, I stared off in track of him, going quickly and cautiously. I could see him wiping his face all the way, and I was not sure now how he had not been running before. I walked very slowly now and watched him carefully. He stopped at the blacksmith's. I stepped into hiding and saw the door open, and Ermac entered the house. It was one o'clock. I could tell by the look of the sea and the grass. Chapter 8 A few days passed as best they could. My only friend was the forest and the great loneliness. Dear God, I had never before known what it was to be so alone as on the first of those days. It was full spring now. I had found winter green and millful already and the chaffinches had come. I knew all the birds, and now and again I took a couple of coins from my pocket and rattled them to break up the loneliness. I thought to myself, what if Deirdrick and Islin were to appear? Night was coming on again. The sun just dipped into the sea and rose again, red, refreshed as if I had been down to the drink. I could feel more strangely on those nights than anyone would believe. Was Pan himself there, sitting in a tree, watching me to see what I might do? Was his belly open, and he sitting there, bent over, as if drinking from his own belly? But all that he did, only that he might look up under his brow and watch me. And the whole tree shook with a silent laughter when he saw how my thoughts were running away with me. There was a rustling everywhere in the woods, beasts sniffing, birds calling to one another. Their signals filled the air, and it was flying year for the maybug. 
Its humming mingled with the buzz of the night moths, sounded like a whispering here and a whispering there. All about in the woods, so much there was to hear. For three nights I did not sleep. I thought of Deirdre and Eslin. See now, I thought, they might come, and Islin would lead Deirdre away to a tree and say, Stand here, Deirdre, and keep guard, keep watch. I will let this huntsman tie my shoestring. And the huntsman is myself, and she will give me a glance of her eyes that I may understand. And when she comes, my heart knows all, and no longer beats like a heart, but rings as a bell. I lay my hand on her. Tie my shoestring, she says, with flushed cheeks. The sun dips down into the sea and rises again, red and refreshed, as if it had been to drink, and the air is full of whisperings. An hour after, she speaks close to my mouth. Now I must leave you. And she turns and waves her hand to me as she goes, and her face is flushed still. Her face is tender and full of delight, and again she turns and waves to me. But Didrick steps out from under the trees and says, Islin, what have you done? I saw you. She answers, Didrick, what did you see? I have done nothing. Islin, I saw what you did. He says again, I saw you. And then her rich, glad laughter rings through the wood, and she goes off with him full of rejoicing from top to toe. And whither does she go? For the next mortal man to a huntsman in the woods. It was midnight. Aesop had broken loose and been hunting by himself. I heard him bang up in the hills, and when at last I got him back, it was one o'clock. A girl came from herding goats. She fastened her stocking and hummed a tune and looked around, but where was her flock, and what was she doing in the woods at midnight? Ah, uh, nothing, nothing. Walking there for restlessness, perhaps for joy, t'was her affair. I thought to myself, she had heard Aesop in the woods and knew that I was out. As she came up, I rose and stood and looked at her, and I saw how slight and young she was. Aesop, too, stood looking at her. Where do you come from? I asked. From the mill, she answered. But what could she have been doing at the mill so late at night? How can you venture into the woods so late, I said, you so slight and young. She laughed and said, I'm not so young, I'm 19. But she could not be 19. I am certain she was lying by at least two years and was only 17. But why should she lie to seem older? Sit down, I said, and tell me your name. And she sat down, blushing by my side, and told me her name was Henriette. Then I asked her, Have you a lover, Henriette? And has he ever taken you in his arms? Yes, she said, smiling shyly. How many times? She was silent. How many times? I asked her again. Twice, she answered softly. I drew her to me and said, How did he do it? Was it like this? Yes, she whispered, trembling. Chapter 9 I had some talk with Edwarda. We shall have rain before long, I said. What time is it? she asked. I looked at the sun and answered, About five. She asked, Can you tell so nearly by the sun? Yes, I answered, I can. Pause. But when you can't see the sun, how do you tell the time then? Then I can tell by other things. There's high tide and low tide in the grass that lies over at certain hours. 
and the song of the birds that changes. Some birds begin to sing when others leave off. Then I can tell by the time of the flowers that close in the afternoon and leaves that are bright green at some times and dull green at others. And then, besides, I can feel it. I see. Now I was expecting rain, and for Edwarda's sake, I would not keep her there any longer on the road. I raised my cap, but she stopped me suddenly with a new question, and I stayed. She blushed and asked me why I had come to the place at all, why I went out shooting, and why this and why that, for I never shot more than I needed for food, and left my dog idle. She looked flush and humble. I understood that someone had been talking about me, and she had heard it. She was not speaking for herself, and something about her called up a feeling of tenderness in me. She looked so helpless. I remembered that she had no mother. Her thin arms gave her an ill-cared-for appearance. I could not help feeling it so. Well, I did not go out shooting just to murder things, but to live. I had need of one grouse today, and so I did not shoot two, but I would shoot the other tomorrow. Why kill more? I lived in the woods, as a son of the woods, and from the first of June it was close time for hare and ptarmigan. There was but little time left for me to shoot at all now. Well and good, then I could go fishing and live on fish. I would borrow her father's boat and row out in that. No, indeed, I did not go out shooting for the lust of killing things, but only to live in the woods. It was a good place for me. I could lie down on the ground at meals instead of sitting upright on a chair. I did not upset my glass there. In the woods, I could do as I pleased. I could lie down flat on my back and close my eyes if I pleased, and I could say whatever I like to say. Often one might feel a wish to say something, to speak aloud, and in the woods it sounded like speech from the very heart. When I asked her if she understood all this, she said yes. And I went on, and I told her more because her eyes were on me. If you only knew all that I see out in the wilds, I said, in winter, I come walking along and see perhaps the tracks of ptarmigan in the snow. Suddenly the track disappears. The bird has taken wing. But from the marks of the wings, I can see which way the game has flown. And before long, I have tracked it down again. There is always a touch of newness in that for me. In autumn, many times there are shooting stars to watch. Then I think to myself, being all alone, what was that? A world seized with convulsions all of a sudden. A world going all to pieces before my eyes. To think that I, that I, should be granted the sight of shooting stars in my life. And when summer comes, then perhaps there may be a little living creature on every leaf. I can see that some of them have no wings, they can make no great way in the world, but must live and die on that one little leaf where they came into the world. Then sometimes I see the blue flies, but it all seems such a little thing to talk about. I don't know if you understand. Yes, yes, I understand. Good. Well, then sometimes I look at the grass, and perhaps the grass is looking at me again. Who can say? I look at a single blade of grass. It quivers a little, maybe, and thinks me something. And I think to myself, here is a little blade of grass, all quivering. Or, if it happens to be a fir tree, I look at them. Maybe the tree has one branch that makes me think of it a little, too. And sometimes I meet people up on the moors. It happens at times. I looked at her. She stood bending forward, listening. I hardly knew her. So lost in attention she was that she took no heed of herself, but was ugly, foolish-looking. Her underlip hung far down. Yes, yes, she said, and drew herself up. The first drops of rain begin to fall. It's raining, said I. Oh, yes, it's raining, she said, 
and went away on the instant. I did not see her home. She went on her way alone. I hurried up to the hut. A few minutes passed. It began to rain heavily. Suddenly, I heard someone running after me. I stopped short, and there was Edwarda. I forgot, she said breathlessly. We are going over to the islands, the drying grounds, you know. The doctor is coming tomorrow. Will you have time then? Tomorrow? Yes, indeed, I shall have time enough. I forgot it, she said again and smiled. As she went, I noticed her thin, pretty calves. They were wet far above the ankle. Her shoes were worn through. Chapter 10 There was another day which I remember well. It was the day my summer came. The sun began shining while it was still night and dried up the wet ground for the morning. The air was soft and fine after the last rain. In the afternoon, I went down to the quay. The water was perfectly still. We could hear talking and laughter away over at the island where men and girls were at work on the fish. It was a happy afternoon. I was it not the happy afternoon. We took hampers of food and wine with us. A big party we were, in two boats, with young women in light dresses. I was so happy that I hummed a tune. And when we were in the boat, I fell to thinking where all these young people came from. There were the daughters of the lensman and the district surgeon, a governess or so, and the ladies from the vicarage. I had not seen them before. They were strangers to me, and yet, for all that, they were as friendly as if we had known each other for years. I made some mistakes. I had grown accustomed to being in society and often said, do, to the young ladies, but they did not seem offended. And once I said, dear, or my dear, but they forgave me that as well and took no notice of it. Ermac had his unstarched shirt front on as usual with the diamond stud. He seemed in excellent spirits and called across to the other boat. Hi, look after the hamper with the bottles. You madcaps there. Doctor, I shall hold you responsible for the wine. Right, cried the doctor. Just those few words from one boat to another seemed to me pleasant and merry to hear. Eduardo was wearing the same dress she had worn the day before, as if she had no other or did not care to put on another. Her shoes, too, were the same. I fancied her hands were not quite clean, but she wore a brand new hat with feathers. She had taken her dyed jacket with her and used it to sit on. At Air Max's request, I fired a shot just as we were about to land. In fact, two shots, both barrels, and they cheered. We rambled up to the island. The workers greeted us all, and Air Max stopped to speak to his folk. We found daisies and corn marigolds and put them in our buttonholes. Some found harebells. And there was a host of seabirds chattering and screaming in the air and on the shore. We camped out on a patch of grass where there were a few stunted birches with white stems. The hampers were opened and Air Max saw to the bottles. Light dresses, blue eyes, the ring of glasses, the sea, the white sails, and we sang a little, and cheeks were flushed. An hour later, my whole being was joy, and even little things affected me. A veil fluttering from a hat, a girl's hair coming down, a pair of eyes closing in a laugh, and it touched me that day, that day. I've heard you've such a queer little hut up there, Lieutenant. Yes, a nest and the very thing for me. Come and see me there one day. There's no such hut anywhere else and the great forest behind it. Another came up and said kindly, you have not been up here in the north before. No, I answered, but I know all about it already, ladies. At night I am face to face with the mountains, the earth, and the sun, but I will not try to use fine words. What a summer you have here. It bursts forth one night when everyone is asleep, and in the morning there it is. 
I looked out of my window and saw it myself. I have two little windows. A third came up. She was charming by reason of her voice and her small hands. How charming they all were, this one said. Shall we change flowers? It brings luck, they say. Yes, I answered, holding out my hand. Let us change flowers, and I thank you for it. How pretty you are. You have a lovely voice. I've been listening to it all the time. But she drew back her harebells and said curtly, What are you thinking about? It was not you I meant. It was not me she meant. It hurt me to feel that I had been mistaken. I wished myself at home again, far away in my hut, where only the wind could speak to me. I beg your pardon, I said. Forgive me. The other ladies looked at one another and moved away so as not to humiliate me. Just at the moment, someone came quickly over toward us. All could see her. It was Eduarda. She came straight to me. She said something and threw her arms around my neck, clasped her arms around my neck, and kissed me again and again on the lips. Each time she said something, but I did not hear what it was. I could not understand it all. My heart stood still. I had only a feeling of her burning look. Then she slipped away from me. Her little breast beat up and down. She stood there still, with her brown face and brown neck, tall and slender, with flashing eyes, altogether heedless. They were all looking at her. For the second time, I was fascinated by her dark eyebrows that curved high up into her forehead. But heavens, the girl had kissed me openly in sight of them all. What is it, Edwarda? I asked, and I could hear my blood beating, hear it as if it were down my throat so that I could not speak distinctly. Nothing, she answered, only that I wanted to. It doesn't matter. I took off my cap and brushed back my hair mechanically as I, as I stood looking at her. Doesn't matter? Aramac was saying something a good way off. We could not hear his words from where we were, but I was glad to think that Aramac had seen nothing that he knew nothing of this. It was well indeed that he had been away from the party just then. I felt relieved at that, and I stepped over to the others and said with a laugh and seemed quite indifferent. I would ask you all to forgive my unseemly behavior a moment ago. I am myself extremely sorry about it. Edwarda kindly offered to change flowers with me, and I forgot myself. I beg her pardon and yours. Put yourself in my place. I live all alone. I am not accustomed to the society of ladies, beside which I have been drinking wine, and I'm not used to that either. You must make allowances for that. And I laughed and showed great indifference to such a trifle that it might be forgotten, but inwardly I was serious. Moreover, what I said made no impression on Eduarda. She did not try to hide anything to smooth over the effect of her hasty action. On the contrary, she sat down close to me and kept looking at me fixedly. Now and again she spoke to me, and afterwards, when we were playing Anki, she said, I shall have Lieutenant Glan. I don't care to run after anyone else. Saw for Satan, girl, be quiet, I whispered, stamping my foot. She gave me a look of surprise made her wry face as if it hurt, and then smiled bashfully. I was deeply moved at that. The helpless look in her eyes and her little thin figure were more than I could resist. I was drawn to her in that moment, and I took her long, slight hand in mine. Afterward, I said, no more now. We can meet again tomorrow.